<laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have listened to the debate on the appropriation bill. I have enjoyed some of the moments of levity. I have reflected and now it is my turn to lend my support. But always I am very mindful of the fact that I can do this. I can stand here only because in the first instance, the people of Miku North have afforded me that privilege to represent their interests and to do so with the grace, wisdom, patience, and guidance that only God can give. I can opt to begin the debate by responding to questioning or challenging whether it is the United Workers Party's administration thrust or focus is based on sound philosophical or economic principles. We can engage in some kind of philosophical argument as to which is the better approach or I can spend my time responding to the conversations that have ensued on racism. I choose not to to the extent that I stand here as an unambiguous black woman, a St. Lucian citizen, mindful of the various isms that can interfere with one's ability to fulfill one's divine calling. And that is not limited at all to the conversations about racism. And I'll say no more on those isms at this point. Mr. Speaker, again in this debate, I hear questions about the performance of the government and whether it is this St. Lucia is a St. Lucia that serves the citizens of this beautiful, this government serves the citizens of this beautiful country. And to my mind, there's no better way to begin to assess the work of the government than to review the contractual arrangement that we engaged or entered with the people of St. Lucia when we articulated our vision for the people of this country. And so I combed through the manifesto. I combed through the constituency manifesto. I reviewed some of what we had done, and I will use the remaining time to give an account of what we have done. Because doing is what the United Workers Party is known for. Mr. Speaker, curiously, I begin at page 12 on the United Workers Party manifesto. And it says, a new UWP administration will give special attention to our youth with regard to the provision of support in the following areas. And I notice that youth is a consistent theme in this house. There are those who say what they will do, having had the opportunity to do in the past, I will say what we are doing and what we have been doing and will continue to do. On page 12, we promised expanded and improved skills training programs, highly employable ICT skills training, 
animation and film skills training. And Mr. Speaker, I can refer you to the activities that the South and West Community College, for example, with respect to what we are doing in animation and the digital media, the new curriculum, and that is not only limited to the activities at South Louis, but is also consistent with what we are doing at the primary school and secondary school level with robotics, animation, digital competency courses, and our e-education initiative. Mr. Speaker, under the guidance of NSDC's Mrs. Selma Sengri, and uh, along with NELU, we continue to offer programs to ensure that our most vulnerable continue to have access to training programs that will enhance their employability. And a similar demographic group is catered for and has been catered for through programs such as what we ran with the Sky and the Yes I Can. The Yes I Can was done in collaboration with the Cuban government. On page 21, Mr. Speaker, provide support for broadband connectivity in rural districts. Participate actively in the implementation of the Caribbean Regional Communications Infrastructure Program, better known as CARSIP. Fully incorporate ICT in the national school curriculum at all levels. Provide adult literacy classes in ITC in communities around St. Lucia. Provide ICT training of teachers. Ensure that professional level computer science is taught and encouraged. And I'm taking a snapshot of what's on that page, Mr. Speaker, to remind us of the CARSIC project that we debated just a couple weeks ago. The interventions with respect to our fitting various communities with free Wi-Fi. The expansion of broadband in secondary schools. The collective intervention of telecommunications partners such as DINSA and FLO, along with the NTRC, ICT in schools policy, all these things, Mr. Speaker, speak to our delivery on what was promised on page 21 in the United Workers Party Manifesto. Mr. Speaker, I turn to page 30. And on page 30, you will read, the new UWP government will introduce and enforce standards throughout the education system. In order to facilitate equal access in these difficult economic times and to parents who have economic challenges, we will reintroduce full transportation subsidy and expand the school feeding program restructure and expand the textbook support program, modernize and restructure the curriculum unit, etc. Mr. Speaker, again, I'm taking a snapshot of page 30 to remind us that we have introduced new standards from early childhood education through to the tertiary level when we came in this house, this most honorable house, to pass the various accreditation bills and the re-registration program of the early childhood education centers continues. We are doing exactly what we promised. Mr. Speaker, I continue on page 30 and the story of the school feeding program is clear. Not only did we do more to the existing program and invest in the existing school feeding program. We recognize the need to run a pilot at the secondary school level as well. And I really want to thank Ms. Henville and her team for 
re-engineering the school feeding program and that was done and continues to be done in collaboration with sister agencies such as the Ministry of Health, especially Ms. Hans, the nutritionist, and in collaboration with the Ministry of Agriculture through a facility afforded us by our good friends, the FAO. So Mr. Speaker, when I had suggestions of the need for the schools to work alongside agriculture and health so as to enhance the product offering as it pertains to school feeding, we are already doing this. Mr. Speaker, I turn to page 31 and it reads, the UWP government will create conditions that allow access to relevant education focusing on children with special needs. Seek to educate children with special needs in a least restrictive environment. Ensure that principals and teachers working in regular schools are offered training and facilities in order to help integrate children with disabilities in those schools. It goes on again to reference use of ICTs in special education. Ensure that students with disabilities are offered technical and vocational skills and provide special education assistance to children and parents and to ensure public education. All of these, Mr. Speaker, speak to the area of our students with special needs. I will tell you what we have been doing, what we are doing, and what we will be doing in that regard. The Viewport Special Education Center is going to be completely renovated and rehabilitated. The Donata School will receive a new school and plans are very well advanced in that regard. We have also, through our special needs, education needs unit, sought to offer more support to students and parents with special needs. We have had to rehabilitate the center in Denry, which is severely overcrowded, Mr. Speaker, but we are seeking to make greater provision for those students in need. We have also, Mr. Speaker, afforded teachers who have an interest in special needs education the opportunity to seek further professional training in the area of special needs. Notice, these are the things that we are doing. Mr. Speaker, on page 32, two things that jumped at me. A special established accreditation for training agencies and processes for registration as it pertains to early childhood education. Introduce summer literacy and numeracy camps for children who have not performed at the expected level. Let me indicate, Mr. Speaker, we have long lamented, for example, the poor performance of our students in mathematics and the introduction of what we have dubbed the numeracy hour has gone a long way in uh, ensuring that those students who perform below the level at which they ought to between forms three, four, and sometimes four and five, that that intervention is made so as to enhance their mathematical uh, competency. We have long spoken about it, now we're doing something about it. On page 33, realign the secondary school curriculum to provide emphasis on mastery of key subjects such as languages, sciences, mathematics, it goes on. Provide computers in schools again activate the special education access fund in fact let me deal with the previous two before i turn to the education access fund a few weeks ago in this very same house we debated a resolution seeking additional funding for CARSIP. 
and you'll recall as well, late into the night, albeit, that we also debated uh, uh, a resolution seeking additional, seeking financing for what we have done, the Human Capital Resilience Project in the tune of $20 million funded by the World Bank. This is the genesis of that kind of intervention, Mr. Speaker. And you'll recall that on that day, on that occasion, when I spoke on the Human Capital Resilience Project, I cataloged the, the involvement of my ministry and my colleagues from the very inception, which began with an educational tour to Washington, D.C., to meet with World Banks at the World Bank and its officials. Mr. Speaker, on page 34, the new UDLP government will seek to develop, develop relevant knowledge, skills, and attitudes in continuing education, informal, lifelong learning, etc. Again, through NELU, the SKY program, the Yes I Can program, NSDC, we have been able to fulfill this. I want to comment on CARE because CARE which is that agency we engaged uh, right after the last common entrance exam because we had long lamented that there are children who underperform at common entrance and then they move on seamlessly to the secondary school system and continue to perform poorly. Thanks to this partnership, we can now cater for those students who need that kind of remedial intervention so as to develop their competencies up appropriate to their age and what is expected of them by way of their academic development. We have sourced a million dollars from our friends in India to help support that institution as it pertains not only to their infrastructural rehabilitation but their programming as well. Develop adult learning enrich enrichment centers. Again, I've cataloged some of that, but very importantly to indicate that we've been able to repurpose some of the existing ICT centers into what we call innovation and job readiness centers. And there is pictorial evidence all over social media and testimonies by participants to prove that we've been doing exactly what is denoted here at page 34. The last bullet point on that page, continue the training of teachers, educators, and administrators of learning establishments to help them assist their students to keep abreast of changing trends and development in education, science, and technology. Let me again reference uh, the Global Partnership for Education, the Commonwealth of Learning, our own uh, homegrown uh, Summer Institute for Teachers, the various scholarship opportunities for the professional development of teachers to fulfill exactly that commitment. Accelerate the process of the establishment of Sir Arthur Lewis University College, provide greater access for advanced and tertiary education, and Mr. Speaker, I know that you are very much aware of all of the innovative and creative adjustments that we've been making at Sir Arthur Lewis, leading, leading us into the implementation of the Gateway to Careers, thanks to the partnerships that we have with international universities, some of which were born out of a study tour that we conducted recently to Florida, whereby we can afford students of Sir Arthur Lewis a seamless transition to a US-based university to qualify for partial or full scholarships based on their performance. And also, Mr. Speaker, very importantly, we have finally introduced the Bachelor of Nursing, and this is something we ought to be very, very, very proud of. There are other bachelor programs in the making at Sir Arthur Lewis, and in due time, these will be made public. And I want to thank the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College community and the board for their, for their tenacity and their insistence that the time is now ripe for the re-engineering of Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Mr. Speaker,
uh, it is amazing uh, the number of times uh, that reference is made to e-learning, distance learning, ICT facilities, the internet, etc. as it pertains to education within this manifesto. And let me say that for those of us who perhaps have very short-term memories, it was rather curious that in a statement here in this house by this minister on the ecosystem of e-education that I had detailed the activities that we're undertaking in the ministry with respect to e-education. Mr. Speaker, I hasten to add that on that day, we could not have foretold what COVID-19 would have done and would have meant with respect to implementing and putting into action much of what we had already conceptualized, but more importantly, accelerating some of what was already in progress. And I must therefore thank all the stakeholders in the education system for the, the Herculean effort, the extraordinary effort that has been made and that was made to allow for a minimum disruption in the education of our young people during uh, uh, the COVID-19 lockdown. I want to say publicly as well how grateful I am to the examinations unit and my other colleagues at the ministry for ensuring that our grade 6 students, which is the, the common entrance class, and our fifth formers, the CXC class, for their seamless reintegration into the classroom while observing the various protocols as prescribed by the Ministry of Health, even in the time of crisis, Mr. Speaker, we are able to continue to deliver to the children of this nation. Mr. Speaker, I continue to comb through the pages provide appropriate support mechanisms to facilitate the spread and entrepreneurial culture and development of youth in microenterprises. And I thought I heard my colleague minister reference the intervention of his good ministry to ensure that our young entrepreneurs are very well equipped not only to respond to the challenges that we currently face, but also to maximize on emerging opportunities in uh, the national economic space and beyond. Partner with the private sector in the creation of a national youth apprenticeship program with emphasis on spotting niches and creating employment. Mr. Speaker, let me reference just four meetings that I have had in the last couple of years with the private sector with the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association, with the Chamber of Commerce, and a wide cross-section of stakeholders. All various meetings held at different points in time to do what? To ensure that one, they stand ready to create opportunities for our young people so that they can have uh, the experience of working in a particular environment as it pertains to their respective studies, we know immersion, job immersion is very important. And I want to thank them publicly, not only for what they have been doing, but the expression of embracing even more of our students in that regard. And Mr. Speaker, therefore I tell you, job immersion is very, very important. We do it not only within the formal education sector, but also through our National Apprenticeship Program, uh, where our students who, in collaboration with Monroe College, get the opportunity to retool, to acquire certain competencies in hospitality, and they are absorbed um, within the hospitality and tourism sector, both here and abroad. This is what we are doing uh, for our young people in this country. Mr. Speaker, on page 40, the subtitle reads, empowering younger people through sports. And Mr. Speaker, we all know, and it was rather interesting, just about three days ago, you know Facebook sends you, sends you those reminders or highlights certain historic events, and up popped four photographs which we had taken at the first conference.
consultation that we had held with stakeholders at the then Grosley Secondary School when we were brainstorming the St. Lucia Sports Academy. Mr. Speaker, this academy is now up and running two and a half years after conceptualization. I want to say further, Mr. Speaker, not only have we exerted effort to provide a physical plant and curriculum along with a residency component, but we have gone further to ensure that we have created partnerships with overseas universities so as to allow for that CMS transition uh, to overseas universities for the simultaneous academic and professional or sporting professional development of our young uh, St. Lucian athletes. This is what we are doing. And of course my colleague, minister and friend from Denry North, Denry South, I beg your pardon, has articulated the efforts that he has been making and the success has already been realized, not only with respect to the construction of new sporting facilities, but the holistic intervention in sports, ensuring that we have facilities, programming, and the, the mentorship and other um, co-facilities co to ensure that our young people can truly realize their God-given gift and exert their exuberance. Mr. Speaker, I continued, ensure on page 41, this one really struck me, ensure youth participation and representation in all aspects of national development. I challenge anyone whether there was any a time when the youth sat in on many of the decision-making bodies or consultations as it pertains to education and the other things that fall within my remit of this ministry. In fact, my colleagues will say to you, always I remind them, have you invited youth representatives to sit in this meeting, in this consultation? We did it when we were considering the e-books. We did it when we were considering how it is we are going to reintegrate students into the school system within a COVID-19 context. Just last Thursday, they were part of the stakeholder meeting. So again, it is not that the youth are an afterthought in this administration. They are integral to what we do in this United Voters Party administration. Mr. Speaker, let me turn to something which I think is, is, is very interesting and I, I really want to encourage my colleagues because even while I went through this exercise, I was able to highlight and identify the areas that fall within the remit, ministerial remit of my other colleagues the deliverables that they are able to tick and I want for us to do this exercise because I think sometimes we're so busy working we don't get the time to sit back analyze and even celebrate the wins that we've made this is not to suggest we're there yet but we certainly have come a very long way in this United Workers Party administration Mr. Speaker there was so much to talk about. I thought perhaps the best way to do this was to create a small table for myself. Well, it's not a small table by any definition. I can only reference part of it. And to highlight what we are doing. Curiously, the first thing on this table, skills for youth empower, employment, skills for youth employment program. 1.2 million EC dollars already with a program that's already in progress with 1150 young people being trained and certified in the Caribbean vocational qualification. That is what is ongoing, not a promise to the youth, ongoing. Climate resilience and energy efficiency. 
the promotion of sustainable energy usage in schools. One million US dollars, thanks to the government of Italy, and the preliminary activities have commenced by identifying schools where electricals meet the basic benchmark, and that can go a long way, Mr. Speaker, in meeting our renewable energy commitments. The Human Capital Resilience Project, which I referenced a while ago, 20 million US dollars. Again, there was some earlier commentary on the mismatch between that which is taught in schools and that which the labor market requires. I have, as I have indicated, I had at least four meetings with stakeholders and we are bridging that gap and correcting that mismatch by investing in the alignment of educational outputs correcting and curing the mismatch that has existed for years and it's thanks to 6.1 million euros from the 11th EDF that we're able to do that through TVET. We are doing this, Mr. Speaker. My colleague from Grosley referenced his early childhood center in Moshi and I want to say that we are constructing three early childhood development centers one in Moshi, another in Jack Mel, and the third in the village of Miku, because Moripo already has one. Mr. Speaker, we've had so many conversations about safety in schools, disaster resilience, public health and safety in schools, etc. There are two programs, Mr. Speaker. One, thanks to a gift from Norway, 140,000 US dollars, and another amount of 66,000 EC dollars, both of which will benefit our students in the very important issue of health and safety protocols. Thanks to COVID-19, these have come to the fore. And some of the beneficiary schools include Gordon Walcott, Canaries Infant, Viewfort Infant, Sufra Primary, etc. Mr. Speaker, I did say that we have promised, we have delivered on our promise to enforce standards at the early childhood education centers, what we call preschools. And it's thanks to $80,000 from the OAS that we've been able to work alongside with our preschools and the administrators to ensure, as with everything now, that they meet the re required standards. In the area of e-education, ICT's education, thanks to a gift of $120,000 from the OAS, and a further gift of $2.2 million EC dollars from the Taiwanese, and a further amount of $30,000 $30,000 and another one million US dollars. Mr. Speaker, evidently a large sum in the tune of millions all going towards e-education in this country, not limited only to equipment, but to training, outfitting of schools, integrating the curriculum into the classroom, a comprehensive ecosystem of e-education already ongoing. Mr. Speaker, training and infrastructure. I heard passing reference to equip. You will recall my first intervention on this equip project. I very graciously indicated that it was something that we had inherited on paper. And as we are known to do, we have taken it from the paper and into implementation and the equipped program is well on its way with scores of teachers having been qualified, new structures having been designed and ensuring that students with different, who are differently abled, areas such as technical vocational education, the rehabilitation, governance, management, and all of these things are very well catered for in the revised EQUIP project that we are currently implementing. Mr. Speaker, again, to answer the question, what are we doing for our youth? I will recall that I was in, in, in 
in opposition at the time, which is a good place to start one's career actually, because you can sit here and ask yourself whether there's a different air flowing in the room depending on what side of the eye you find yourself. But I, was, I have been consistent in my acknowledgement of the hard work of the Miku Secondary School principal and staff and the dire need for a new school plant. A school that houses over 700 students. And you will recall, Mr. Speaker, in 2017, I had reason to knock down the third form block. But guess what? The new block is being constructed starting this week. The Miko Secondary School, Mr. Speaker, is easily the second largest secondary school on the island as per the data I last received. Mr. Speaker, I'm not satisfied, I've said it here and in other spaces, I'm not satisfied the construction of a new block. I've always asked for a new Miku Secondary School, given that in the very first instance, it was a temporary structure that turned 50 this year. You know temporary has a curious meaning in the solution political context. So, Mr. Speaker, I am very, very delighted to say this evening at 5 p.m. there will be a stakeholder engagement fully cognizant of the social distancing protocols to discuss the construction of an entirely new Maywood Secondary School thanks to this government. Mr. Speaker, listen, your Lager school is coming, so in fact, it was met with your team last week, was it? Yes. Mr. Speaker, you will have noticed that innovation is part of the nomenclature of this ministry, but as with everything else, one needs to have a roadmap, a guiding light, etc. And I really want to thank the National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, along with Compete Caribbean, for partnering with us to begin the work on the, the, the uh, drafting of a science, technology, and innovation policy, something which is much needed in today's context. I have referenced the adult literacy interventions, and there are many other things on there, Mr. Speaker, that time would not permit me to go through. Let me turn to sustainable development, Mr. Speaker, a department that is known internationally for its exemplary work. And I heard a question during the course of this debate, what are we doing to mobilize resources to build resilience? And these references that I'm about to highlight offer but an indication, a very small indication may I, may I add, I know my team may want me to go to the entire table, of the kind of work we have done and the energy we've exerted to raise resources so that we can satisfy the very question that was posed, what are we doing to mobilize resources to build resilience? This is what we are doing. We have been able to raise through the, uh, the, the Department of Sustainable Development, 11.9 million EC dollars, which will benefit farmers, fishers, craft producers, broom makers, such as the broom makers in La Pointe, Supreme Brooms, again, all with sustainable livelihoods in mind within a context of climate change. 11.9 million dollars, Mr. Speaker. We have also been able to raise $943,000, again, Mr. Speaker, with the undertaking to ensure that what we do, why we eke out a living, does little or no harm to the physical environment because the focus is always on sustainable livelihoods. Mr. Speaker, we've also been able to raise in keeping with our efforts to support the shift to electric mobility, not only have we put in place the policy framework and the suite of concessions to those who wish to buy those kinds of vehicles, but we are doing the accompanying work, and for that, we have 
have raised $2.4 million, which will be shared with sister agencies such as the Transport Department, the Renewable Energy Division, etc. Mr. Speaker, you are aware that I also hold a portfolio in gender relations. And this one that's very dear to my heart. And perhaps on another occasion I will share with you how it is gender relations came to fall within the Ministry of Education. But today and in response to the question, what are we doing for women? You see, the doing, Mr. Speaker, is not a knee-jerk reaction when there's an unsavory news item about a woman, a man, or a child who has suffered some kind of violence. The doing goes deeper than that. And the doing is also in collaboration with sister agencies, such as my colleague minister, who's in the upper house, Minister Herman Gil Francis, and ensuring, for example, that, that the forensic lab was up and running. Because that's critical to ensuring that there is swift justice. And I recall, too, how many times I spoke about uh, the forensic lab when I was in opposition. That is why I saw to it, it was one of our top priorities. And now it is up and running and properly outfitted and has been given even more resources. What are we doing, Mr. Speaker? With respect to gender in particular, we recognize, as a colleague from the other side intimated, the special and particular vulnerability of women, especially within the context of climate change. That we have women farmers, for example, we have women agro-processors. Again, thank you for the Urge um, agro-processing uh, plant, my, my, our chocolate uh, makers, our other agro-processors use that place that they had long waited for. Uh, thank you for that intervention, Minister for Agriculture, member from Babano. We have also gone on to ensure that of the monies available in the context of COVID, for example, that we are well poised to benefit from those resources, particularly for our women farmers, and women small business entrepreneurs. And I want to thank Ms. Joseph and her team, a very small unit, the Gender Relations Unit, but it's amazing what they have accomplished in the past three years. Things that for decades we've been wanting to do in this country. For example, Mr. Speaker, the long-awaited domestic violence legislation. You have heard me say on occasion that that legislation is not to be viewed in isolation. It comes along with a suite of other pieces of legislation that together will serve to protect the interests, well-being, rights, etc. of vulnerable children, women, and we have already gone with one piece of legislation as it pertains to children, for example. But this one is well advanced and we are awaiting final commentary from some key stakeholders. And my hope, Mr. Speaker, is that the usual long and winded process of engaging, especially the final rounds before this thing comes to the House, that we can fast track it. It needs to happen and needs to happen under our watch as we are known to do. The COVID-19 pandemic, again, highlighting the particular vulnerability of women. You know that during the lockdown, there were concerns and anxieties about gender-based violence. And we were able to partner with uh, the UN Women to ensure that we create a pathway of engagement, an essential services package to ensure more efficient and responsive system to vulnerable women. And I want to thank the Royal St. Lucia Police Force and other agencies for marrying our efforts to ensure that these particularly vulnerable women did not suffer unduly within the context of a COVID-19 lockdown. I thank them very much for their intervention whenever they were called upon to do so. The Gender Equality Policy and Strategic Plan Again, working along with ECLA and tying together the various elements that we've been working on for the past two years, 
finance input by our good friends within the UN system, but also a very good friend in the person or personality or jurisdiction of the Canadian government um, for partnering with us to ensure that more funds are available, again, to help our women, especially our vulnerable women. There's so much more I need to say on the ministerial front, Mr. Speaker, but before I can be a minister, I must be an MP. I'm very, very mindful of that. So allow me in the remaining half hour, <laughs> in the remaining time, Mr. Speaker, to, to reference some of what we've done at the constituency level. Mr. Speaker, the St. Mary Road indeed member for Denry North has been done all these in phases with the final phase soon to be completed. Isn't that so, Mr. King? Absolutely. Honorable member for Catherine North has said absolutely within full view of the viewing public. So, Mr. Speaker, I know we can hardly recognize the young lady on here, but back in 2011, I made a commitment to the people of Miku North and it was a 14-point plan for Miku North back in 2011. Curiously, Mr. Speaker, the first bullet point reads, my first commitment to the people, develop and improve sporting facilities in Miku North. Look at this photo, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the first, there we go. So this is me conducting a site visit, but the one on the title slide was the groundbreaking ceremony for this new facility in Miku Village along the highway. And you know, Miku North is a community very, very well known for its sporting prowess. But not only have we done a new field or are doing a new field, Mr. Speaker, we have in the interim rehabilitated multi-purpose courts in Passias and in Miku, and we have completed the construction of the Wen Road leading to the Moripo playing field, all of course ensuring that the sporting fraternity gets what it deserves. I wonder who did that. The lady with the lady on here, thanks to a good government under the leadership of the Minister of Finance uh, from Miku South, my neighbor. And he needs to share his gifts as he's known to do. So we're expecting a swimming pool in the second part of the, the project on the Miku playing field. Mr. Speaker, Dialogue with sports councils to recognize, strengthen, and link plans throughout the constituency. In fact, way back in 2011, one of the first meetings I held was with the sports councils of Monipo and Miku upstairs, the, the Monipo Community Center, and we had agreed back then that reasonably we can't expect a mini stadium in every quarter of the community. We agreed as a community, as a constituency, that we would fix the Wen Road leading to the Wen playing field because this is where cricket is played primarily, although other sports are played there as well. And that Miku Village would receive the attention as it pertains to football and that would continue to pour resources into the various multiple sports. And that's exactly what we've done, Mr. Speaker. Develop Miku North as a premier cultural tourism site. You would have heard on previous occasions that Miku North is within the community of, of the list of communities earmarked for village tourism. And if anyone had any doubt that we are serious about ensuring that Miku North assumes its rightful place in any conversation about cultural heritage in St. Lucia, Mr. King, on the eve of one Creole Day in 2018, was it? And sure, I beg your pardon. Oh, member yeah. for Cassidy's North. I stand corrected, oh, yes. sir. I do beg your pardon. Member for Cassidy's North ensured that we built a new road to the home of our queen of culture, uh, Dame Cess and Descartes, as a preliminary activity to the other activities that we already have in trade. And when that money is finally made available, you'll see the other aspects 
of that village terms of unfolding, albeit in phases. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, there are other things on there. I reference lifelong educational programs. And I want to thank my colleague from Grosley. His, the, the ministry that falls under his watch, Ministry of Equity, was able to partner with the agencies in my community to offer training to our women in Miku North. And while they did that, we went on to offer babysitting services to enhance the level of participation, being very mindful that sometimes women want to participate, but they do not have the requisite babysitting services to relieve them to access the training. So thanks to the Ministry of Equity and other agencies in my community, we're able again to leverage the use of the Innovation Center and uh, Innovation and Job Readiness Center to deliver that program. Establish a state-of-the-art health and wellness center, Mr. Speaker. And albeit too many years too late, it is here. So, Mr. Speaker, the Miku Health and Wellness Center is well on its way, and I know that the people of the community are very, very pleased with that development. I want to thank my colleagues uh, for their support in that regard. Mr. Speaker, rehabilitate agriculture feeder roads. There are other references to installing an appropriate infrastructure to facilitate housing development. So, I want to indicate that all this was back in 2011. I am very mindful of that commitment to the people. And I want to remind my honorable friend from Miku South that we have a meeting scheduled on Sunday to meet with the developer of the, the lands that are earmarked for affordable housing for the people of Miku North, as I promised back in 2011. Mr. Speaker, the last one, there are, there are others on there as well, but I want to highlight the last one. Institute of Pilot Mandatory Early Childhood Education Program. One of the things that struck me when I returned to my community in 2010 after being away for a few years was that during school hours, I saw many mothers and young children who should at that age be in a preschool as we call it, just around the place. And on each occasion that I inquired, often the concern was that they could not afford to send their children to school. And Mr. Speaker, from, my, from 2011, even while in our position, I have uh, uh, supported parents to allow for their children to attend what we call preschool, to pay for that, and that has a triple benefit because it also allows for the parent to access a job uh, while the child is in school. So, Mr. Speaker, there are other things on there. Let me indicate that the one that references our fishermen, let me say to the fishermen in Miku Village in particular, your dream of a jetty is still very much in the making. You would have heard the Honorable Member for Shuazel Saltibus reference a, uh, a visit to Japan where he discussed the situation in Shuazel. What he did not say and what the Minister and Member for Babylon did not indicate that part of that conversation included the new jetty in the village of Miku. So the same, the same challenges that the, minute, the Member for Shuazel Saltibus has highlighted with respect to the difficulty that a technical team has coming over here in a COVID context to continue the technical work, it is that very impediment that is barring our fishermen from realizing uh, their jetty. And uh, when they disappear, uh, s'il vous plaît, ces gens mi kwa se peche la, mwen sa mi chek ta yo ka ple we ek za fe sa da som sa yo vle jeti yo. Mwen jadi yo, Nous ka konsidewe jetia. Nous ja komanse konversasyon et fe japanese la. L'année passée, 
même pour choisir sortir bis et même même pour Babolo, yo tous les deux t'es allé Japan et mais quoi ils t'ont mené aussi des péchés et puis pour y causer. En même conversation ça là, nous yo parlé aussi à soujetia pour ces péchés à un vilain micou. Mais quand nous tout ça, nous ni un petit problème, un petit problème, un gros problème avec Covid 19. C'est pour ça ces gens, ces Japonais là qui étaient si posés venir ici là pour garder le projet, ils ont proposé ça venir et ça c'est un truc qui est bien important parce que en conversation ça nous te, ils ont fait nous comprendre, ils ont même ni pour venir pour faire ces quartiers, tu vois par exemple quand nous quand ils voient zéro, marcher terre, garder qui ça qui bizarre qui manière yo kai bati et moi vle ba yo a assignance là ça c'est un projet gouvernement ça là sérieux en fait so moi vle yo point on tise une pli patience mais ça bagay ça là pas aisé pour yo marcher en saga ensemble pour yo aller en cannot you pour yo aller pêcher but i want them to know that, that I'm committed to doing this and we will exert every effort that we can to ensure that we do this for the fishes of our community in the same way that we are committed to resolving and enhancing the conditions for the seaboard farmers in Poilé in the same way as we are committed to commissioning the facility in Poilé and ensuring that there is maximum use of it. I have spoken about the health center which curiously was repeated in 2016 also the feeder roads so let me walk you through the slide that you have here so we have the the lockers and again let me indicate in all graciousness that this started under the previous administration but it's left to us to finish it and to and to commission it and the next slide will showcase mr speaker the concrete road newly built leading to the poly community center a road that the residents have long waited for and this was constructed a couple months ago we also rehabilitated the community center at the end of that road this is in mayette um, mayette gardens this road for those of you who have traversed that road uh, it was pretty much <laughs> non watchable for most of it but uh, and, and thanks thanks to the intervention by this good government we've been able to build that road hillview road my ex gardens both pedestrians and motorists alike can benefit from a newly paved road on the next slide mr speaker you will see uh, two recreational parks being built one in monipo which is right next to the health center and community center which as you know is the hub of the monipo community next to the catholic and sda church named after a long serving preschool teacher by the name of teacher joey and she also last year um, received one of uh, the queen's uh, birthday awards and she's more than deserving on the following slide you will see another recreational park built uh, at the Miku village extension again uh, for the benefit of our young people our children and there's a space a safe space where they can recreate along with their families uh, following that mr speaker you will see that uh, at new village a um, new extension Miku what, what we call the pack we built the roads in that neighborhood in about three phases because sometimes you don't get all the money all at once so you do it as the money comes in and it's to show good faith and to indicate that to the people that things are, are coming so we have now done the three main arteries in that community i know that people are very very grateful for that on the following slide mr speaker um, not only, and I insist and I've said so and I continue to say that, that I understand the importance of the holistic representation that I give.
that we focus on the physical infrastructure, but also what we call the social infrastructure. And this picture depicts one of the career readiness fairs that we've held. At that fair, we, we showcased both private and public sector agencies uh, that were on hand to engage job seekers. We also had their universities and colleges, such as the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, Mr. Speaker. And interestingly, on that day, people left with job opportunities and the bursary and scholarship opportunities in the same way as I had done previously when I was in our position. So this is not the first to have been held, but we have the pictures of the most recent one. The next slide, oh, the Dr. Gail Rigobert Netball Tournament, which has been going on for years and years, which I started in our position, because netball had not always received the kind of support uh, that the other sports did. And I started in our position with the support of the then uh, member for Denry North, uh, who was the then Minister for Sports, and the good member from um, Denry South has continued in that vein to support this initiative to allow our young ladies that opportunity. I was very clear on the last occasion that we had the netball and football tournaments that another tournament would not be held before the completion of the new field. So now that we are approaching the completion of the new field, Mr. Speaker, we can expect to see the tournaments return. And the first football tournament will be held in the name of our fallen soldier, uh, sports enthusiast, uh, league uh, president, uh, the late uh, Ryder Showery. You see as well, I support the veterans. Uh, some of the young men have taken a very keen interest in the veterans tournament. In fact, we've actually won one such tournament, and I pray that their joints will continue to allow for them to play and win. In the following slide, Mr. Speaker, the Mirage Sacks Preschool, the Early Child Education Center in Monipo, was in urgent need of comprehensive rehabilitation, and we have been able to do that. And as I indicated, a new early childhood education center will be built in Miku village on the old site of the, what was then known as the community center near the post office. So Mr. Speaker, um, I, I know that uh, Miku Primary School Rehabilitation, we have also built a new wing at the past years, the combined, the merged Maripo Passias Combined School. All of these things, Mr. Speaker, tending not only to the physical infrastructure, but also to the social infrastructure, ensuring that our people receive a better start, a good head start, that they continue to talk, stand tall as residents and citizens of Miku North within uh, the wider St. Lucian public. Um, Mr. Speaker, there's so much more to say, and so many more slides that I can show. But I think the next one references uh, when roll. This is the favorite one for a member for Denry North. I don't know why he has such a keen interest in that road. My Mr. Speaker, the St. Mary Road, the St. Mary Road we built in phases. And as you heard for yourself, the member for Cassius North has indicated that he will, with the resources afforded him by the Minister for Finance, complete the St. Mary Road. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you for the applause, that's fantastic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the next slide, I think, brings us closer to the end where we show what we have done by way of small projects, again bringing relief to the people. Of course, we don't showcase the scholarships, the health and, and, and other kinds of interventions because, Mr. Speaker, I firmly believe when people come to your office and they have a tea cozy with you and you make an intervention, it is not always for you to showcase. Here we have the Miku Summer Camp, which I've done from our position, youth parliamentary debates. The, the representation and intervention, Mr. Speaker, with my senior citizens, uh, two of them in my lifetime, three of them have turned 100 years, and we're expecting another one this year, and I'm looking forward to that kind of celebration, a comprehensive cleanup of the community. Um, Voyage, thank you for Voyage. Voyage will become the new husbandry capital of St. Lucia. And, and uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I know that uh, the young farmers and
Man and uh, the farm workers in the area are very excited about that project because they will be gainfully engaged and employed not only in the construction but in the operations of that project. COVID-19, Mr. Speaker, as you have heard, introduced its own set of challenges and this is just a small depiction of the kind of intervention we've made. I can talk about what we've done with the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. I remember you should be wrapping up. I should be wrapping up indeed, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but but let, me, let me say how grateful I am for the support, the encouragement of my constituents um, from Margaret to Lapwa to Esca to Monaco, Passia, St. Mary, Mamiku, Puale. Right? The farmers in, in, in Peluj, in Maho, in Rayo that benefited from a road constructed very soon after we came in was rehabilitated. I want to thank my constituents for, my, for their support. I want also to thank the colleagues at the Ministry of Education, Innovation, Gender Relations and Sustainable Development for ensuring that our ministry delivers on its promise to the people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, I wish to thank you for your indulgence.